Uh, Kalinda, can you just check that we have got a quorum to reconvene, please? We do have a quorum online at the moment, <coughs> Chair. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to item 12, members, um, and that's on page 307 of your agenda. Um, this report calls for our decision on delegating to the chair, and I'm adding the deputy chair of the planning committee, um, and the chair of the environment committee, uh, environment and climate change committee, I should say, and the deputy mayor and an IMSB member uh, to approve our submission <coughs> on the um, wetland provisions to the National Environmental Standards Freshwater 2020. Um, I won't outline, outline the balance of the recommendations there. Uh, we have Dave Allen, our Manager of environment, uh, Natural Environment Strategy, uh, who is the author of, of this report, along with David Hempson. Um, and David is uh, Team Leader in Resource Consents, specialising in earth, streams and trees. Now, I will hand over to Dave. Before I do that, um, can I have a mover for the recommendations, noting the slight changes there as well in red? Can I uh, ask for a mover, please? Happy to move. Uh, Chair, it's me, Josephine. Councillor Bartley, thank you. Do I have a second, please? Councillor Coombe, happy to second. Thank you, Councillor Coombe. It's moved and seconded. I'll now hand to Dave Allen. Uh, good afternoon, uh, members of the Planning Committee. Uh, Dave Allen, uh, Auckland Plan Strategy and Research Department here with you this afternoon. Um, and I just wanted to um, take the opportunity to outline some of the uh, uh, proposals that are contained with a managing our mud uh, discussion doc sorry, managing our wetlands discussion document uh, produced by Ministry for the Environment. Uh, so we've got um, a presentation of about 10 slides here for you. Um, so Duncan, if I could just uh, ask you to roll through uh, the next to the next slide, please. So as the Chair has outlined, our purpose today is to seek delegated authority uh, for Pacific members to approve Auckland Council's uh, submission to the Managing Our Wetlands proposals. Um, before we get on to some of the actual uh, content and to get your feedback your initiative on the um, proposals um, I just wanted to just uh, introduce this by noting the legislative context that has gone before this particular discussion document has come out from Wellington uh, next slide please Duncan so this is actually um, part of the essential fresh water fresh water package that we're actually considering here. One of the instruments is called the NAP, National Environmental Standards for Freshwater. It's very closely linked to the National Policy Statement for Freshwater um, Management. And um, there were a number of other regulatory instruments introduced last year uh, as part of a big package within um, the government's desire to uh, stop the degradation of um, freshwater environments and see some improvements um, within a generation uh, in terms of some of the outcomes for freshwater environments across New Zealand. Um, the fourth um, instrument that I've listed there is relation to uh, water take um, measuring and reporting, and there's some further improvements there about how we go about um, improving uh, that aspect of freshwater management. Next slide, please, Duncan. Ah, yes. So um, the two that I want to focus on today is both the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management and secondly, the uh, National Environmental Standards for Freshwater, um, which um, both um, came into effect in about September last year. And they have in each of these documents some particular provisions that relate to wetlands. And um, they're quite significant in terms of uh, their intent. Uh, but equally, we've got an issue in terms of did the policy intent overreach and I think that's that's largely why we've got the discussion in front of us uh, today. Thank you, Duncan. One of the key aspects, uh, sort of the fundamental concept of the National Policy Statement for Freshwater, talks about uh, Timana Utiwai, which is a hierarchy of obligations that that set out that we should be looking to uh, firstly look after the health and well-being of water bodies and freshwater ecosystems prior to uh, considering the health needs of people, 
And then lastly, um, then we need to be considering how people and communities provide for their social, economic and cultural well-being, uh, both now and into the future. So that's the central tenant of the um, NPS freshwater management. And um, that in itself is makes it quite clear for communities as to the direction of travel uh, into the future. Now, as a result of uh, the uh, various instruments being brought in uh, in September 2020 last year, a number of concerns were raised by councils, um, communities and landowners, um, also um, uh, some of the uh, uh, land operation, uh, sorry, operators of networks, um, and also iwi uh, raised some concerns about the practicality of some of the wetland provisions that were to be implemented. So um, I'll outline some of those concerns and I'll basically just run through kind of our initial staff feelings about some of those proposals uh, that are now contained in the Managing Our Wetlands discussion document that was released on the 3rd of September. So the first question is, how do you define a natural wetland? Um, now, in the National Policy Statement, there is a... Um, a section that um, talks about the particular elements of how you define a natural wetland, and that definition has proved quite problematic in terms of its application and how it might be interpreted. Um, one of the key issues is that um, it sort of relies on some sort of judgment about what improved pasture is. It talks about um, at a particular date as to when you should reference uh, what the status of a particular wetland is. Um, it, it sort of introduces a mix of um, considerations about what species of, of plant are involved. Uh, and it also talks to um, whether or not uh, there's some rain derived uh, water pooling that is a temporary, in it of a temporary nature. And one of the concerns about that is that um, this definition, as it was put up, uh, became problematic for people who had sort of wet pa uh, pasture occasionally um, in areas that were never really uh, uh, or have been heavily modified since um, many generations ago and the land use is quite different now. This affects a number of um, uh, industrial uh, uh, sort of sorts sort of opportunities as well. So it affects not just the agricultural sector but also some of the industries that um, have written in with some concerns. Uh, the revised definition is a lot clearer. It actually makes sure that the policy intent was focusing on those areas that were clearly identified as um, natural wetlands and um, makes it a lot um, clearer about how you might actually um, uh, uh, seek to interpret um, some of the aspects without uh, confusion about some of the reference points that were uh, identified in the original um, definition. So the staff assessment from across um, all of the council departments and CCOs is that this does go a long way to improving uh, the definition and application of, of this particular um, uh, part of our law and that we should support this definition. Next slide, please. Uh, yep. So the other uh, concern uh, was that um, the policy intent behind um, uh, stipulating a greater understanding of what um, was happening in particular wetlands uh, by uh, in terms of restoration activities was that it provided councils with a greater understanding as to what was happening by the community and other members um, of, of um, with interest in the particular wetland area. And um, it meant that they, there were a number of uh, regulatory requirements that some of these community groups might then need to actually adhere to, to actually go and undertake some of these restoration activities or um, maintenance activities. Um, so it became a bit um, burdensome for the, um, for the community more broadly to um, comply with some of the uh, positive enhancement activities that were envisaged uh, when we looked at um, uh, some of those community initiatives. Um, this also affected council operations across the country as well as um, some of the Tangata Whenua aspirations as well. Um, the 
provision as it was originally introduced covered off restoration only and it didn't really um, include an element of maintenance in the definition of restoration and for any um, uh, there's a lot of um, maintenance activities that are required to upkeep uh, the quality of some of our um, wetlands uh, so basically um, the proposal here is to include a maintenance aspect in the uh, provision for uh, restoration and uh, also to make it clear as to how some of the biosecurity aspects associated with um, wetland management are going to be um, given effect to. So um, there's a number of uh, bullet points there that talk to how um, some of the uh, biosecurity uh, issues that can be better addressed, whether that's a, a pest plant that might be uh, surrounding the uh, margin of a wetland or something like that. Um, the other thing is that um, it did talk to some of the tools that might be needed to um, allow for some of those activities to occur. So there's a, a, a bullet point there about um, some of the hand tools that might be used. So in general, staff support the um, the uh, provision of these additional um, uh, approaches to how uh, restoration, maintenance and biosecurity activities should occur within uh, and around wetlands. Next slide, please. The um, one um, key uh, area that's included within the discussion document is looking at additional consenting pathways for various activities around wetlands. and. Um, this is largely because, um, as I mentioned before at the start, that the original definition of wetland um, was quite broad and it has started to affect significantly some of these activities that I've listed here. Um, and in particular, quarrying um, the landfill, cleanfill, managed fills and the mining um, areas were particularly um, uh, of concern to various operators in those industries and they argued that um, they um, operated in particularly um, uh, heavily modified environments that might be like um, have temporary rain uh, pooling um, or it might be um, have some remnant of some particular um, wetland feature uh, and they were concerned that um, by these activities becoming classed as prohibited um, by, by, by interpretation of the regulations that they would actually have a significant impact on our day-to-day -day lives in terms of these kinds of activities from occurring uh, within um, various parts of the country. So um, in the case of the urban development uh, consenting pathway, we'll get onto that in another slide, but one of those one of the things that was raised there is that um, there was a concern that the um, the protection sought for wetlands might be um, going to a, such a level that it would start to really impinge on some of the urban development aspirations around the country. So we'll get onto that in another slide. But I just wanted to highlight that um, what is proposed here is that some of these activities which are operating in heavily uh, modified environments, um, which might have a feature that would otherwise qualify for being uh, defined as a, a wetland area could be subject to a gateway test to enable some consideration of a consent for some of these activities. And the gateway test at a high level uh, talks about uh, assessing whether or not um, the activity is of significant national or regional benefit, uh, whether or not there is a functional need for that activity to occur only within that specific location and uh, also that in doing um, uh, or considering one of these sorts of activities that the effects management hierarchy was applied and that um, you know there was appropriate level of conditioning in terms of um, how any of those activities could occur. And the key thing to note there is that um, you know one of the first tests is how can you avoid um, these kinds of activities uh, from occurring and that may be possible in some cases but not necessarily others. So that's the general thrust of um, uh, the proposals for additional consenting pathways. I just wanted to, before I get into a bit more detail, I just wanted to highlight that um, the initial staff position is to support um, 
including a consenting pathway in the Nest Freshwater for quarries, landfill and mining activities. These are all activities that are uh, pretty localised and where they can actually occur uh, by virtue of their particular um, uh, uh, needs, like uh, there's certain geolog geologies involved and also in the case of landfills there's potentially a whole range of other controls that might be appropriate uh, or that can be put in place. Uh, the choice of site for landfills is probably more limited as well um, than um, the, and in the case of the uh, latter, um, our initial start position is to possibly look to uh, oppose inclusion of a consenting pathway for clean fills or managed fills. Those kinds of activities, there are probably more options for where those activities could occur. Thanks, Duncan. Uh, sorry, uh, still going. Just one more, oh, one more slide. Still going. Okay. Yep. Sorry. I'm um, just to then focus on the urban development. Um, sorry, one slide back. Okay. Just to focus on the consenting pathway for urban development. Staff have not um, made a particular recommendation as to whether to support or oppose a consenting pathway and associated gateway test for urban development. Um, what's interesting in the first bullet point of this slide is that. The, cons the discussion document makes reference to the fact that um, the intent is to strike a balance between the necess necessity of protecting natural wetlands but also to provide for housing and urban development where appropriate. So that is kind of a, a quite an interesting policy um, debate between how you look at that and how you look at Te Manaro Tiwai or locally expressed as Te Morio Tiwai. Um, and the principles involved uh, with applying that uh, uh, concept. Um, the proposal for urban development looks to um, uh, looks to consider the term plan-enabled zoning and use that as a basis for determining what areas would be um, applicable, applicable for uh, consenting pathways to enable um, some activities to occur in and around wetlands. Um, that's only um, the first um, part of um, how they propose to roll out um, the criteria for how urban development will be provided a consenting pathway for in the short term. In the longer term, it would refer to a range of other um, planning tools that would um, uh, indicate where urban development would occur. And there's some big questions, I think, here in terms of how we um, consider whether or not urban development should be um, uh, given consideration for this particular um, approach and how it sort of sits in with um, a policy sort of directive from the NPSFM to protect wetlands. Excuse me. So, so um, there's probably more time I think required for us over the next week just to really uh, nut out how this might um, work in practice, how the effects management hierarchy might work. Um, whether or not offsetting a wetland loss would still be a fit for purpose approach uh, for urban development um, and um, just really considering how well some of the existing path uh, of sorry the existing planning instruments are doing at the moment in terms of looking after natural wetlands and making an assessment as to whether or not this consenting pathway would revert back to the way we've done things in the past or whether it would still um, help in terms of providing for wetland protection. Um, and I think I had one last slide which just um, highlighted the next steps. Um, next week uh, on Monday I'm meeting with the local board reps to just generally give, the, give them an overview and a, a question and answer session. Um, and then by end of next week we'll have the last uh, input opportunity for local board mana whenua. Um, we're looking to um, complete a draft submission probably by the 13th of October uh, and then trying to get that to um, our delegated list of councillors by 22nd of October such that we can get the submission away on the 27th of October. Um, it's all quite compressed as usual with central government um, processes. Um, I'm sort of quite pleased we actually managed to get this paper to uh, the planning committee uh, today because um, there's been quite a lot of work already uh, behind the scenes to try and Firstly, work out what this proposal is all about and bring at least some indications to you as to what we think might be an appropriate um, basis for uh, 
the planning committee, or sorry, the delegated councillors to to uh, look to include in the submission that you will make. So, Chris, I think I'll end it there. Thank you very much for that. No, thanks, Dave. Thanks to you and your team for doing this. It's considerable work, um, and it's a big topic. Dave, just just to paint the picture here, I mean, I hear in nationally we've lost 95% of our wetlands. Um, in Auckland, what is that percentage? What have we lost in Auckland? Um, well, I think we're still working on that. We've got a 10-year monitoring program that the research and evaluation team are working on at the moment, and they basically are due to publish that uh, within um, probably the next six months. Um, uh, David Hampson's on the line as well. He would possibly be able to talk to what he has seen through the resource consents um, area. Uh, David, are you able to just offer some insights there about the loss we've uh, undertaken so far? Welcome, David. Thank you. Uh, with permission from the chair, um, it's very difficult to quantify um, off the top of my head uh, the overall extent of wetland loss um, so far, but what I would say is prior to the release of the, um, the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management and the uh, National Environment, we were really, really difficult to um, to prevent the loss of natural wetlands. Um, most of the applicants, most of the applications that came across my desk um, really didn't address avoid remedy, um, went straight to mitigation. Um, and I'm not aware of uh, any applications prior to these documents becoming effective September last year of uh, either applications being notified or consents being declined. Um, and that covers a vast range of um, activities that inc includes quarrying, includes residential development um, and also infrastructure, Auckland Transport, uh, water care um, and NZTA. Um, so I don't have any figures as such but that's, as th th that's the best I can give you in terms of what's been happening, uh, what was happening prior to September last year. Okay, look, that's good. Just before I go to the questions, I'm just trying to, wanting to get a bit of a, a sense of how much is left. Like, I, I'm familiar with areas like Papatoitoi, I think, east, and Takanini, Manurewa, um, just those areas. There were vast wetlands in these now residential areas. They no longer exist. They're not here in Auckland. And we know we've lost uh, wetlands throughout the nation, and we're down to the last five percent so we don't have a sense of the Auckland situation of what's been lost over the last you know 150 odd years 200 years um, I don't have that at the top of my head but I do know that we have um, GIS mapping that's uh, undertaken we've got a, a range of um, assessments that are gradually being uh, put into our um, GeoMaps database uh, so we will have a, an ability to better articulate uh, the loss um, and, or maybe what the current state is and then we can sort of look back a bit and sort of give you a feel for what the loss, loss might have been um, over a longer period of time uh, just based on some of the other um, uh, elements of um, the kinds of um, geography that we actually have and, and where, where habitats might have been in the past. Um, but I think uh, from a quantitative perspective, no, we don't have exact figures but we would would have no problem suggesting that um, there has been significant loss. Um, the national assessment is, I think, about 5,400 hectares is, uh, has been lost in the last year, I believe. So um, there, there is a continuing um, uh, loss in general. Um, I think there's um, not only wetlands, but of course uh, rivers and streams are also affected. Um, so we need to sort of think about the whole catchment, um, not just the one particular water body we're talking about here today. 5,400 hectares in the last year alone. Yeah, that is really concerning. Okay, we'll go to questions. Member Hanare, please. Kia ora, Chair. Look, uh, just a couple of uh, questions about um, Māori involvement. This, is, this, this issue is quite, a, uh, quite an important part of uh, mana and where they, where they see their place uh, on the earth. And I'm wondering, one, is what sort of uh, engagement are you doing uh, to 
sure that uh, the council Fano's submission uh, takes takes in what mana whenua are, are saying, are wanting, um, you know, uh, instead of just some sort of uh, uh, tick box sort of um, Maori impact statement. And and I suppose the second one is is that um, a call from the IMSB to uh, walk, work alongside you uh, in terms of the producing of a of a uh, submission uh, that we could we can be part of rather than us putting in a uh, a separate um, standalone submission. Thank you. Thank you, Member Henry. Uh, Dave, responding to that? Yes, thank you. Um, so we've um, contacted uh, uh, representatives across the region, um, I think it was on the 6th of uh, September, advising them of the uh, discussion document and seeking um, uh, input and or opportunity to submit directly to Wellington. Um, what I'm intending to also do is to circulate this uh, planning committee paper and the presentation uh, to them as well uh, with a view to sort of following up uh, and, and just giving them that additional information and then trying to contact some of them who wish to discuss this further. Um, we have of course um, been going on a bit of a roadshow recently in terms of the national policy statement for freshwater management um, through plans and places staff um, where some of the broader uh, uh, aspirations of area representatives have been outlined. Um, we do obviously have the um, uh, the uh, Tamaki Makaurau um, uh, iwi forum, which um, provides us with some uh, thoughts about the uh, significance of uh, water to to Auckland and to iwi. So um, we have a number of sources of information that we can actually uh, use. Uh, we have a water strategy in development where we've got um, ongoing engagement with iwi and so we can uh, look to uh, bring in some of the thoughts from that perspective into the submission. And to your last point, uh, yes, uh, in terms of the uh, delegated sign-off, we've included the IMSB uh, member there, um, but again, happy to, um, uh, once we had a draft sort of um, together, you know, and to basically come down and have a have a talk with um, the relevant people about how we can um, build in some of the other concepts uh, that that might be uh, wish to be included. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Member Henare. Um So the very last point that Member Henare made was maybe a, a suggestion to go a little bit further than just having an independent Māori statutory board member. Uh, as part of the delegated group, but actually to work a lot more closely with the Independent Māori Statutory Board itself and its secretariat to um, to actually have a, a, a more deliberate um, submission that reflects the Independent Māori Statutory Board, where it might depart from the position of the Council and where it aligns with the Council. So I just want to check this uh, with you, Member Henare, was you are seeking a more deliberate account of the independent Māori statutory board uh, view uh, uh, to be going in with the council's submission? Is that what you're seeking? Yeah, yeah, pretty much, Chair. Um, oh, it, it, it's, I suppose, my language, it's a, it's a more hands-on approach rather than just the delegated authority that we get to see and then we get to say no or yes. Um, it's, uh, I suppose at the secretariat level, uh, we have some definite skills and uh, some highly skilled uh, people down at the secretariat. And I, and I, and I think it would be uh, in, in our uh, best interests, both council and IMSB, uh, to have have that more hands-on uh, approach to this than 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 most things. Yeah, look, I tend to agree. Uh, Dave, can you just uh, make a note of that, and we'll we'll pick that up in the next stage, please. Yes, no problem. Thank you. Um, now I'm just checking on my questions here. I think it was um, Member Wilson. Now I may have missed somebody there, but I'll go back. Uh, can I go to Member Wilson now with a question? 
thank you, Mr. Chair. I've covered off in the chat box that uh, these have my points have already been covered. I don't require any more time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Member Wilson. Didn't quite keep up with the chat box there. Um, are there? Ah, yes. Uh, the Deputy Mayor, please. Deputy Mayor, Councillor Cashmore, your question, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thanks, Dave, for um, the presentation and the words. And I know you've been all over this, and I know you've had a lot to do with the essential fresh waters packages as they go through the Ministry and Parliament uh, down in Wellington. So thank you on behalf of us all for that diligent work of yours. Um, a couple of fairly simple questions to set a scene for a start. The initial re recommendation that came out with this proposed essential fresh waters package was to have all works. Um, that cover off wetlands, including a, you know, a puddle in a paddock or, or on a development site, uh, would be prohibited. Um, have you got any sort of insights as to how such a piece of, how such a proposal could come to fruition without the actual practical tests? Yeah, there was a lack of um, testing with the regional sector about some of the provisions that were um, uh, wished to be pursued. And it did respond very much to the goal uh, that uh, central government had of um, arresting the, the decline of um, natural wetlands. And I think they took a fairly, um, uh, you know, they, they took a very broad interpretation of what a natural wetland might be. And, and I think half of the problem relates to how a natural wetland was defined, such that we did end up with a original definition last year, which. Um, really affected um, a number of uh, industries and or landowners where the actual value of the actual uh, land that they were on, like just for example a, a wet bit of pasture uh, or a, um, a, a quarry with um, you know sort of just like a, a small um, damp area that collects water, uh, was significant um, to the extent that they would actually um, be closing shop. So. Um, there was a bit of a recognition, I think, even with an MFE, that um, the interpretation that the council had applied, which was pretty much saying, well, that's what you've given us, uh, was over uh, over the intent. The, in the policy intent was not actually de deliberately designed to go as far as it did. Unfortunately, because they didn't test it with the regional sector, um, they um, really have created a bit of a situation whereby some of the uh, legitimate uh, 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 operations in heavily modified areas uh, would no longer be able to be continued. And this is really about sort of correcting, I think, um, firstly, the definition of what a natural wetland is, but then secondly, asking the question, um, in very heavily modified areas that are unlikely to ever um, be able to go back to uh, some improved state. Um, is there is, a, is is it appropriate to add some consenting pathways to uh, allow that activity to continue? And is that part of it, part of the consultation that we go back with our, our solution, saying, hey, we think the definition should be should be discretionary or restricted discretionary, um, or is that prohibited part of it still going to be there with exceptions for certain classes? So yes, the, the sorry, there's a couple of aspects to this. Is that yes, the intent is to go back and say, um, do we support or oppose uh, particular consenting pathways being provided for these additional activities? These additional activities, by virtue of the fact that they were not included in the original regulations, uh, were deemed either prohibited or non-complying, depending on where the activity occurred, um, and. Um, then uh, we need to also say uh, if we do go back and say we support um, this activity having a consenting pathway, let's say at discretionary, what are the other safeguards that we might want to see in place to ensure that um, that can still continue um, appropriately? Thanks Dave. And my last question goes uh, partly to what the Chairs talked about where we've lost last, you know, with the Auckland context. It's slightly different from most other areas in the country, a big chunk of urban. So we've lost a lot of wetlands in the, in the areas that um, the Chair mentioned, plus others that are urban, and they were urbanised you know, over a period of time. And we are seeing in the rural areas where wetlands are being put back where they can be expanded upon, but not all of them can obviously go back because they are productive 
pasture lands these days. And the, is there any movement you think from the Ministry actually you want to see all wetlands put back as they were? And, and, the, and talk about the two different contexts of both urban and rural and the practicality around that. I think one of the aspects I'll just focus on there is that um, one of the reasons why the staff support um, restoration, maintenance and biosecurity activities is that it actually enables some of those sorts of um, activities that might occur in both urban and rural environments uh, where uh, certain um, degraded wetlands are improved. Um, I don't think there's necessarily a, uh, there's certainly a desire to, to protect um, any existing wetlands. Um, and I guess um, the question then becomes in those heavily modified areas that are, are basically, you know, land use has been transformed considerably. Um, it's not intended to bring those back, I don't believe. Uh, so if you're talking about just simply a wet pasture or where a land development has, you know, gone over the top of an area, that's unlikely to be reversed. So, um, yeah, that's probably a comment I'd make on those on those thoughts. Thanks, Dave. And my, I guess if I can, a very quick comment is, is that you know, I am concerned that we are getting these sorts of holes coming through um, from uh, potential acts of parliament coming through the ministries that they're not testing these things with sufficient rigour as far as their pragmatism and practicality and basically doability is concerned. And potentially the financial outcomes, of, if this thing was held upheld as it currently stands, there would be no quarrying and, and we'd lose 25% of all development sites uh, areas, 25% of them, um, right across the country. So the dire consequences of what was potentially proposed here was not thought through, and I find that somewhat alarming. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Deputy Mayor. Are there other questions, members? Am I missing anybody? Dave, just picking up on the points, and I hear the points of the Deputy Mayor there, but if we're looking at um, you know, 95% of wetlands being lost nationally. We don't know what that looks like in Auckland, but it could be higher, approximately the same. When you equate that with, um, say, a nationally um, critical bird species, for example, all the alarm bells would be ringing, uh, would they not? If you were, if you equated this to a species, to Tokawika yeah. or Kakapo. It would be all hands on deck, and there would be alarm, outright alarm. Do you get a sense yes. that there's outright alarm at the loss of this so-called, you know, equivalent species? Yeah. So, so there's a lot of concern about the loss of wetlands in general, and I think the the challenge we have with this kind of paper is to get bro broadly an understanding as to kind of what's not intended to be protected in terms of those heavily modified areas uh, in contrast of what you've just outlined which is if this was you know very clearly a, um, a, a, a kokako um, and, and we were trying to compare a kokako with a um, uh, I don't know a crow and, and, and we, we you know didn't know understand the differences between the two species we'd be saying well actually it's the kokako we want to protect and maybe not so much the crow um, and I think that's part of the issue here is we're trying to say have we got our um, definitions right? Well, has, has Wellington got its definitions right? And then secondly, once we've got those definitions right, to what extent then would you protect um, the kokako of, of the, you know, that we're actually looking at? And what would you do to ensure certain activities um, did not further uh, denigrate from the uh, protection of those habitats? Yeah, thanks. Look, there's the wetland itself, but wetlands don't exist in isolation. They are, they are fed by catchments. Sometimes it's very subtle expressions of water just oozing out of a hillside, uh, and they never stop. Um, so how do we, how does this also address the, the, you know, the boundary that is a bit of a blurred boundary between wetland and and source of moisture? Um, and supply, and also the, in some instances, the necessity to that a, that a wetland on its lower side has a barrier which is holding the moisture. Can you just describe how more holistically the government um, policy writers have got their heads around 
that wider protection and not just 100 meters but actually what it means to be a to be a wetland yeah so there's a couple of um, points First, firstly in the context of the, of the local area that we're talking about the 100 meters um, one is that we've got a number of technical tools that have been published this year to help identify uh, uh, or what, what, what metrics you might use to help identify the, the extent of a wetland so that might be vegetation type, soil type and hydrology um, but then you need to start to think about well what are the adjacent land use activities around that particular uh, ecosystem and how might they affect um, the quality of the uh, wetland that you're trying to look after so for example if you're creating a whole uh, lot of impervious surfaces uh, for urban areas around the wetland how are you how are you thinking about discharging of stormwater how are you thinking about um, the various networks of, um, of other activities such as roading around that particular environment um, and I think this this actually goes to the bigger question about how you do your urban planning. Uh, it basically says, have you got the right level of overlay considerations when you're doing your um, assessment of the NPS UD, perhaps? Um, how how are you determining, uh, you know, all the different uh, tributaries that might flow, the groundwater that might flow into these wetland areas, and 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 what's uh, between them and the wetland so you do need to take a much wider catchment approach and I think we will um, as the NPS FM is gradually implemented from 2024 uh, find that Auckland Council will need to really turn its mind to uh, considering land use uh, within the context of the environmental uh, values associated uh, with that particular um, area. So I think it's going to be much more holistic in terms of how we approach urban land use, uh, sorry, or any land use, to be honest, um, across across the region. Thank you, Dave. Councillor Hills with a question. Good to chair. I think uh, Councillor Simpson was first. Uh, no, you're next. Oh, sorry, sorry. It's all right, uh, Richard. My question's been answered. It's okay. Perfect. Um, yeah, I guess on climate change, and it is mentioned a little bit, but and it probably mirrors a bit of what um, Councillor Darby said, actually. But, you know, we talk about the Amazon rainforest getting burnt down and things, but wetlands actually uh, provide more carbon sequestration than than our forests. And planting, we're talking about urban nahiri and everything we do is planting trees. I guess my question is, what is the impact of of not being strong on this and not actually supporting this, that the, the carbon impact of removal of wetlands that we have barely any of left. Uh, have we looked into, and I always can have a concern that we only look at the one side then of potential negatives, but actually what happens if we are not being strong on pushing on this, especially in the space of our carbon, uh, the legal requirements, but also what that means for the world, considering a third of wetlands were removed in the last uh, 50 years. Yes, so there's been um, a bit of research work uh, over the last decade in particular that's starting to look at this in the New Zealand context um, and actually assessing uh, what is the uh, uh, you know the carbon that is actually locked up in, in the wetlands. Um, and if you're thinking about the Waikato wetlands with all the peatlands uh, which are quite deep, then you are talking significant uh, amounts of carbon that is um, locked up. Um, but um, maybe in a very a shallow uh, wetland uh, in terms of its uh, uh, peat or, or, or the level of peat, um, you might expect much less carbon that's been locked up. Um, and so it really comes down to understanding the geology and um, once you assess um, you know, how um, much carbon is involved in a particular area, then you can get a better, a better appreciation as to how this is um, adding up for this region. Um, I think one uh, example I was heard was that um, I think a hundred tons of carbon are locked up per hectare if it was 30 centimetres deep, the actual peat, um, and that um, that would might be what you would expect in a very shallow peat environment. Uh, if you're thinking about um, a wetland uh, with those characteristics in the Waikato, it's potentially orders of magnitude bigger in terms of the opportunity for carbon uh, being locked up. So I think there is um, value to think about that. I think the um, 
the extent of wetlands within the Auckland region are not obviously of a comparable nature to say Southland or Waikato or West Coast or other parts of uh, the country but nonetheless it is still um, a, a certainly a consideration and perhaps in the next week I might have uh, an opportunity to just dig into that a bit further uh, Richard in terms of uh, what uh, uh, what might what information might be available that's applicable to Auckland? Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hills. Uh, I think we we value these places uh, similarly. So, look, um, are there any comments to be made on this now, members? I think we've um, taken care of the questions. I guess just a small comment from me, Chair. If no one else has mm, one, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think. You know, the, the, the science has been out for a, a while now, but it is newer to a lot of people than, say, um, destroying native forests or the need to build uh, or plant more native forests. Um, that wetlands actually capture carbon at about 30 times the speed and the ability of, of, a, of our native or tropical forests around the world. Um, and we only have 10% left. I think it's about 150,000 hectares, I think, of wetlands have been um, removed for intensive development or agriculture over time across um, Aotearoa. We don't have much left in Tamaki Makoto, but I just want us to think about putting similar value, you know, they aren't the prettiest of things from afar, so often we you know, you could see a native forest being cut down and be pretty depressed by it. But a lot of people don't know when a wetland is, uh, you know, ripped apart because often it doesn't look like much um, or it might, might be inaccessible as, as a forest might look. Um, we're spending a lot of money and a lot of uh, time building back and uh, planting out our forests. We plan to do over 200 hectares of native forest in the next 10 years plus a whole lot of other initiatives, like the Mears Million and a Half Trees and things. But to, and I know that's on public land, um, but there does need to be a stronger uh, stronger presence and a stronger protection of wetlands um, because of flooding risk. We're seeing that right across our city, and we saw it in, uh, out northwest a couple of weeks ago. We are seeing significant problems when the water table is affected by ruined wetlands, but also the amount of uh, carbon emissions that wetlands can, can help us um, sequester and also help us reach our goals. So the, the more we do on the one side of things is going to make it a lot harder for us to uh, reduce those emissions over time if we keep allowing this kind of destruction to happen. So it's not a, uh, for me, it's not a kind of hippie greeny stop development type thing. It's development in the right areas, but it's stopping making the same mistakes as we've made for decades, um, centuries in this country. Um, otherwise, it's too late. And I really have a concern that we continue to uh, make sort of not half um, decisions, but we're a bit worried of making the decisions that science tells us we have to make. And soon legally, we're going to be obligated to to ensure all our decisions are considering these types of things. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hills. Uh, Councillor Cooper with a comment. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I guess for me, looking at Forest and Birds press release last Thursday, they are very exercised and I've got a lot of respect for that group. Um, so I think there'll be a lot of pushback on this. Um, I mean, I think if we just look at, even though we have lost so many of our wetlands, if you look at the way that we develop parks now, if you look at the mitigation on the motorway networks, on the um, subdivisions and our roading, we, we're steering heavily towards re trying to recreate or um, hold on to the last remnants that we have. And the thing is, people actually love them. Um, they're much, you know, often a much more aesthetically pleasing and closer to nature kind of experience for people in urban areas. And they attract wildlife and I know up in my area a lot of that is part of that Northwest Wild Link. There's so many good things to be said about wetlands and, and I'm, I am really concerned that we're losing the last little bits and, and it does affect our biodiversity. So I hope, you know, really that this is a strong enough submission. Um, because there will be public concern. 
and we can't you know we we can't just sort of sit by and and let this happen we have to show that um, we are really concerned about it. I mean, I'm really concerned about a lot of things that are happening very quickly at government level now, including putting off our elections for another year, which is really weird. So people aren't talking to us, and um, I think we need to be really strong in our submission. So I support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cooper. Any other words on this, members? Well, look, I, I echo those concerns, Councillor Cooper. Um, I I'm thankful no one has raised the word swamp here. We all value wetlands. And uh, to Dave and the team, I actually think we need to be seeing a strengthened submission, particularly around um, the area that we haven't worked up at the moment, and that's the consenting pathway uh, under Roman four, B4. I think we've got a lot more work to do there. Um, look, I did raise this point of you know the, the 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 measure of what we've lost here in wetlands against how we would respond to the loss of a, a bird species, a kakapo, as Dave quoted. Um, you know we're we're very quick and and rightly so. Um, you know putting resource into that, but I still don't think we're anywhere near recognising the immense value of our our wetlands. Um, they're huge filtering systems. But as one person described to me as I walked through one of my wetlands, I've got four wetlands as a guardian of these beautiful places. They're like a grocery store uh, provisioning literally hundreds if not thousands of species, uh, mainly uh, insect species but bird species. Um, and looking down into a wetland when you're on top of one you suddenly stop and realize it's just a hive of activity if it's if it's not insect life or bird life that it's there's something moving in front of you there's something so dynamic about a wetland and it's something we haven't valued in new zealand we are beginning to value it i just hope that we do value it in our submission uh like we value a kakapo and you can't have a, a mitigated outcome for the loss of a kakapo. There, there, it's either a kakapo or no kakapo. Uh, you've got to hold fast and hold on to these wetlands, be they small or great. Um, so I'm looking forward to a, uh, and probably I'm inviting a license here, Dave, from you and the team and uh, with working with the Independent Māori Statutory Board and the delegated councillors to even further strengthen uh, um, the, the, the evidence that we will bring in our submission to ensure that we hold these as, you know, real dear Tonga as, so-called assets. I, I would actually say they're not assets for explo exploitation by any means, but real landscape assets, cultural assets. Um, and I look forward to that being worked up. It worries me that we've uh, pretty much expired um, in in the wetland coverage right across this nation. So let's uh, leave it there. It is moved. It is seconded. Uh, shall we put that to the vote, members? All those in favour say aye. 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 And, and to the contrary, no. And we'll declare that carried. Thank you, Dave and team.